Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to our webinar today. My name is Marche, and I am the webinar director here at Advice Chaser. Before we introduce our guests and get started, I do need to do a bit of legal housekeeping. Advice Chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and cannot be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars, such as this one featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own, and however true, funny, or interesting are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information you hear today without consulting a qualified financial professional. Well, we're thrilled to bring you this educational presentation today. Attendees are muted, but we encourage you to ask questions using the chat box. Presenters will answer those queries after the webinar today during our question and answer session at the end. If you have a question, go ahead and leave your phone number as well. If we can't get to your question, we will make sure someone reaches out to you after today's event uh, to, to field that question. We want to make sure that this experience is as educational as possible, so please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion of the material. Well, I'd like to introduce you to today's moderator. Eric Lawrence is the president and managing partner of Tenbridge Partners and holds the designation of certified financial planner practitioner. Eric and his team know that a financial planning is as much about emotions as it is about financial matters. And Eric works to understand his client's individual relationship to money, what excites them, as well as what keeps them up at night. Uh, then the financial plan and the resultant strategy has a much better chance of success. Eric works closely with his clients to make sure this relationship is honored and works to put them on a clear path guided by a sound financial plan tailored to unique personal goals. And Eric, why don't you go ahead and, and say a few words. Um, I know that you will be moderating today. Thank you, Marcia. I really appreciate being here and I'm excited to participate in the webinar today. Um, I, I want to remind everyone to please put their questions in the chat and uh, I'll keep those until the end of the excellent presentation that we're going to have uh, for the Q&A session. But um, I'm very pleased to be here and I'm very excited to hear what our professionals have to say. So thank you once again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'd like to introduce you to our presenters today. Oh, and then Aaron, I did not ask the pronunciation of your last name. Is it Voison? Close enough. That works. No, tell me, tell me what it is. It's Voisin. What with a with a was sound. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I I usually do that at the beginning of our practice session and I did not. So Aaron Wasson has worked in the financial services interest industry since 2005. She's currently the Managing Director of Wealth Management Service at EP Wealth Advisors, where she oversees the financial planning, tax, estate, and retirement plan services offerings. Erin earned her BS from the University of San Diego, majoring in business administration and psychology. She also holds a master's degree in accounting. She is currently a CFP certificate, certificant, certified divorce financial analyst, and enrolled agent. Erin participates in FPA's Pro Bono Financial Planning Days, is FPA Pro Bono for Cancer Volunteer, and co-chairs EP Wealth's Financial Literacy Committee and Outreach, and has also been a founding member and the former chairwoman of EP Wealth Advisors Investing in Women Initiative. Erin also co-chairs the firm's internship and externship program. She is a CFP board ambassador and a member of the CFP Win Council. In her spare time, although it doesn't sound like you have much, Erin <laughs> enjoys spending time with her family, paddleboarding, cooking, and enjoying life at the beach. And I'd love to introduce you to our second panelist here and presenter. Therese Tippy is a tax manager and financial planner. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in business administration with an emphasis in accounting from California State University, Long Beach, and her Master of Business Taxation from the University of Southern California. 
prior to joining EP Wealth Advisors, Therese worked for a public accounting firm for 10 years. She provided federal and state tax compliance services, strategic planning opportunities, and various other consulting services to privately held businesses and their owners. Her experience also includes representing clients in the IRS and F clients in IRS and FTB tax audits. She's a certified public accountant licensed in California and is a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. In her spare time, she enjoys staying active and traveling with her husband and daughter. And we did get a comment, <laughs> go beach, <laughs> feeling a little bit of the summer vibes here. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen here. And uh, oh my goodness, I believe I meant to share my screen, but I never did. This is what happens, guys. There we go. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and then let's go ahead and have Aaron, you can go ahead and share your screen. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you, Marche, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're excited to be here to talk about, you know, money moves that the small business owner can make. So as Marche mentioned, I'm Erin Wazan, and I am joined today by my colleague, Therese Tippy. So we are gonna walk you through what those money moves and things to think about are. So being a business owner, you know, setting up your business has been, you know, your baby. It's all you think about. It's not a nine to five job. It's something that occupies all of your thoughts. But I think a big part of that is what's occupying your thoughts is the business and the mechanics of running the business. Your employees, you know, whether it's building culture or thinking about how to retain or attract good employees to keep your business afloat. Thinking about your overall operations, your vendors, um, you know, supply chain, depending on the type of your business. Then there's the tax and regulatory environment that is out there that you may not be thinking about because it's not usually top of mind. You kind of know that those are things that are out there, but hopefully you're relying on whether it's internal employees that you have to handle that for you, or you built out a really good team of financial advisors to help regulate those things for you. And then it could just be that the business is the crux of your family's income, that this is truly what, you know, puts, you know, pays the bills, puts food on the table. So that stress kind of adds to it. So being a business owner is really stressful. And I think the more that you kind of build out, like we talked about that team around you to help make sure you're thinking about everything um, is super, super important. And so what does business planning look like when it's done the right way? First and foremost, it's making sure that you're thinking about, you know, the knowledge of, that people have that are around you. Are they up to date? Are they thinking about you and what's best for your business? Are they tying it in to both the business side of things, but also your personal side? Because everything that you do in your business is ultimately gonna affect you personally. And so they're really intertwined. And we'll talk about that a little later. And looking at things quarterly. You know, we find that a lot of mistakes that business owners make, which we'll go into, is first and foremost, you're not planning appropriately. You're planning for the business, but you're not planning from a tax perspective, a cash flow perspective, and thinking about other things that you should be doing throughout the year. You're sort of, hey, it's time to do my corporate return, my business return. Here's my stack of documents. Oh, now I have a tax bill. What could I have done differently? So it's making sure that you're really proactive throughout the year or hiring the people around you that are gonna be proactive on your behalf. And then just those people that they're ready to keep up with the pace, know all the changes. Uh, I think last year was a really important year where I think a lot of business owners really had to take a step back and look at their business. I think the pandemic was very eye-opening for business owners in particular about how much cash they keep on hand, the way debt is structured, um, how their business could survive in a, you know, a future if there ever was another pandemic. Um, I always laugh when I think about the business owners that create the lawn signs, you know, the happy birthday or the birthday you know, or the bridal showers. They probably never imagined that this would be a booming business because for a year, birthday parties, bridal showers and such were done 
dry fives, so those big signs became, you know, what everyone wanted. So I think it's just important to really think about all the what ifs that could affect your business. So today we're going to talk about the mistakes that we see business owners make, um, how to evaluate and think about your corporate structure, cash flow, you know, the crux of the business, what cash flow decisions should you be making or looking at, um, deductions and business succession, and then our EP Wealth approach. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Therese, who's going to start the presentation. Thanks, Erin. So the first item we'll discuss is common mistakes business owners make. The first one is paying themselves more than they need to. There are two things to consider here. The first is payroll taxes. Keep in mind that even though you are maxed out for Social Security purposes, you still have Medicare tax. And also, paying yourself depletes your cash, and not having cash in the business could hurt how your financial statements look or could prevent you from buying um, supplies or equipment that you may need. The second one is using their business account for personal expenses. It's good practice to keep business and personal expenses separate, especially on a credit card. If you are ever audited, the IRS will question your expenses much harder if they continuously see personal expenses being written off. Not taking advantage of low interest rates. Interest rates are at an all-time low, so take advantage of this if you need to purchase new equipment or furniture for your business, and maybe even a new building, which we'll get into a little more later. Not having the correct corporate structure. You want to make sure you are structured in the most tax advantageous way and also from a liability standpoint. If you're not sure, you could be exposing yourself to paying more tax than you have to or exposing yourself to liability. You, can, you should consult with your CPA or business attorney if you think you're not or if you just don't know if you are. Not having a tax plan. As Erin mentioned, you should proactively work with your CPA throughout the year to ensure you are getting the advice you need, that you are taking advantage of current tax law to make sure there are no missed opportunities, and at the very least, to know what's coming come April 15th when you file your tax return, if you'll have a large tax bill or not. Using liquid funds to make illiquid purchases. So be mindful about what you use your cash for to make sure it's not tied up. You never know when you'll need the cash. And a great example of this is the coronavirus pandemic that no one was prepared for, but really hurt some businesses. Not having a good bookkeeper. I've worked with business owners for many years, and if they're cost conscious, this is where they try to save money. But it could cost you more in the end. You want a knowledgeable bookkeeper to make sure your financial statements are as, are as accurate as possible. This is helpful, especially if you want to sell your business in the future or just to have peace of mind that you are not overpaying or underpaying your tax liability. Not delegating or hiring a financial professional. It's always a good idea to set yourself up with the right team. Having a good bookkeeper, a CPA, a financial advisor, and an attorney can go a long way. Not having an appropriate insurance plan. Um, you should periodically review your insurance policies to make sure it's sufficient for your current needs. So a policy that worked for you years ago when you were smaller may not be enough for you now that you've grown. Not taking advantage of depreciation. So with bonus depreciation and Section 179, you get an immediate deduction for certain depreciable assets. So this allows you to essentially lower your current year tax liability instead of capitalizing and depreciating an asset over several years, which of course will help with your cash flow. So just to share a quick story here, you know, I had a client who wanted to buy a $1 million piece of equipment, but was concerned with using up his cash. I explained that after factoring in his federal and California tax rates, and then with the um, you know, favorable depreciation, that that $1 million equipment is really only costing him $500,000. And that makes it a lot easier to swallow the cost. And lastly, not having the appropriate retirement plan or any retirement plan. So retirement plans can be a huge benefit to business owners. 
not only is it a tax deduction, but you get to put away money towards your retirement. So that's something to definitely consider and think about if you don't have one. And there's a lot of uh, different retirement plans out there. So working with your CPA or financial advisor and helping you choose the right plan, um, you know, would make sense. And now moving on to choosing an effective corporate structure. So there are many things to consider when it comes to your business structure. What works for your friend may not work for you. Things to consider are cash flow, liability protection, if you want a partner or not, the cost of setting it up, taxes, annual reporting requirements, and control of the business. Um, in the next slide, we'll discuss LLCs, S corporations, and C corporations, which are the more uh, common entities. Um, so the first one, the benefits of a limited liability company. So the reason LLCs are very popular nowadays is it combines the pass-through taxation of a partnership with the limited liability of a corporation. Pass-through income means that the LLC itself doesn't pay tax but that it flows through to you, the business owner, and you pay tax on your individual tax returns. You'll pay both federal and state income taxes as well as self-employment tax, which is about 15%. Um, it's ideal for sole proprietors who want liability protection. Um, you can set up what's called a single member LLC. So everything is pretty much the same since it's still reported on your Schedule C, but now at least you have some liability protection. And it's also ideal for LLCs with multiple partners because it allows more flexibility with pay and structuring how income or expenses are allocated among the partners. Um, and, um, or actually I should say, but don't forget about the California gross receipts fees. So as the name suggests, it's based on gross receipts. So it ranges anywhere from zero to almost 12,000 per year on gross receipts. So even if you break even or lose money, you still have to pay this fee. And then the next slide, we will talk about S Corps versus C Corps. So S Corporations is another popular entity. S Corps and LLCs are actually the more common um, entities that I've seen and have worked with. So with S corporations, you have flexibility in the amount you pay yourself. The IRS requires you to take what they call a reasonable compensation, which could be based on either your industry or profitability. And as a member, you could also receive a K-1 distribution, which is not subject to payroll taxes. Um, and keep in mind, retirement plan contributions are based solely on your W-2. Again, having a good CPA or financial advisor could help you find the right balance between W-2 wages or K-1 distributions. Profits and losses flow through to your personal return, just like the LLCs. Um, in California, there is a 1.5% tax on net income or an $800 minimum tax, whichever is greater. Um, you can have up to 100 shareholders, you must file articles of incorporation and conduct annual shareholder meetings. And generally it's reported on a calendar year, although there are some exceptions. And then with C corporations, um, a little different than S corps, um, you must pay W-2 wages and either a bonus or dividend. Your W-2 must be reasonable compensation. So with C corps here, the IRS is concerned with unreasonable compensation, meaning paying yourself too much to zero out the income to avoid double taxation, which we all know is the downside of being a C corp. Um, so unless you zero out the income, the corporation will be subject to double taxation. Um, a benefit here is it's um, being able to sell your shares is attractive to investors and also the fact that employee benefits are deductible. Similar to S corporations, you must file annual paperwork and keep meeting minutes. Um, and you may file as a non-calendar C corp, which does allow for some income shifting. So overall, in my experience, I feel like it's very rare to see small business owners set up as a C corp 
because of, of double taxation, there are other more favorable business entities to choose from. Um, so again, LLCs or S corps, I believe are the are more common ones. Um, now I'll transition it to Aaron to talk about cash flow planning. All right. So as you look at you know the cash flow of your business, as we talked about earlier, this is going to affect the personal side. So you have to make sure that the money that is flowing through to you personally is enough to meet your everyday lifestyle. So Therese talked about you know, paying for illiquid expenses or keeping money tied up in the business. This is really where, again, we talk about how these two things are intertwined, where your business is really going to affect the personal and you need to be thinking about them simultaneously. On the flip side, you do also really need to look at the cash flow needs of the business. So if you think of the example that Therese gave with that client who was looking to purchase that machinery, you know, this is where having the right advisors who are helping you do cash flow projections is going to be really important because then it makes sense to look at what are the right years to possibly buy those different types of machinery or assets that are needed for the business. Um, what is the working capital that should be kept within the business to make sure that God forbid a year like last year happens again, that you're protected. Um, we'll talk a little bit about real estate and then other major purchases that might be needed. So really just making sure that you're thinking about that cash flow throughout the year. Depending on how your business is structured, cash flow may not be even throughout the year. It may be lumpy. It may be where certain receivables hit at certain parts of the year based on your business structure. So being able to manage and account for that is really important. The cash flow you know, opportunities. We talked a lot about making sure you're paying the optimal wage that's considered you know, reasonable compensation. So when S-Corps arrived, they became pretty popular because as Therese mentioned, you're avoiding that payroll tax on what's considered your K-1 distribution. But first and foremost, you have to make sure that what you're paying yourself as a salary is reasonable. So you saw a lot of people kind of flip to that corporate structure and drop maybe a salary they were paying themselves at 200000 to fifty, thinking, oh, this is a way for me to save on that payroll tax. It's important to make sure you're evaluating that with your CPA and that it's consistent and not unreasonable, like Therese said. Also using bonus depreciation in Section 179 in the right years. So a question a lot of business owners might ask is, well, what's the right year? I don't know how my business is going to look year over year. Again, I think putting the right business plan in place and working with the right advisors who can help really determine what is the right year, taking into account the changing tax environment. So if you've looked at the last couple of years, there have been changes to bonus depreciation that have caused a lot of business owners to accelerate, you know, purchasing things, putting things into service in order to take advantage um, of the bonus depreciation or the section 179. And then reviewing your vendors. I mean, this is a competitive world now. There's lots of, while you're a business owner, there's other businesses emerging to help business owners. So maybe it's your credit card vendors and the fees that you're paying them. Um, looking across all the people that help you in all aspects of your business. Are you evaluating those vendors and doing a due diligence each and every year? Looking at ways, again, where you can possibly save money um, throughout your business. And then structuring your cash flow to look appealing to a potential buyer. So as we get into tax deductions, or I'm sorry, business succession, We'll talk about that. You know, running everything through the business works for a certain period of time until you're getting to that point where you're ready to sell. So now we'll talk about tax deductions. So first and foremost, that retirement plan. So last year, year you know, this year even in particular, you're seeing a rise in people looking at their retirement plan. If you're here locally in California, California released the CalSavers program, which basically meant that depending on the size of your company, you now have to offer a retirement plan. So you saw a lot of business owners having to go look and evaluate, you know, how is that going to affect me and what type of business plan 
should I set up or retirement plan should I set up? I think as you look at the types that are out there, Therese mentioned there's so many. This is another area where it's not a set it and forget it because as your business grows, as your employee base grows, as your cash flow changes, it's important to look at the retirement plan that you have every single year. It's not only important to look at the type, it's who it's with. So there's lots of different providers of retirement plans. So maybe the record keeper or third party administrator, TPA, that you work with. Again, that's a competitive market. So going and looking at those vendors on an annual basis, are they offering you the right services? Are they offering your employees the right services? Are their fees competitive in the everyday market? So another way where, again, you're looking to save for yourself and your employees, but also an area where, again, if you're evaluating the cash flow of your business, where you could possibly find savings. And then we talked about risk management and insurance planning. You just spent a lot of time building a business. Now you really need to make sure that you're protecting it. So making sure that you have the right insurance plan in place for the business, and again, for you personally, and taking into account your employees. So insurance planning doesn't necessarily have to be liability. It could also be the health insurance plans that you offer your employees. Um, depending on your corporate structure, how do you structure those plans? Are you offering plans to your employees that allow for health savings accounts or flexible savings accounts? Just making sure, again, that that is something that you look at. As Therese said, you know, your business changes year over year. So maybe that small business that you started and protected at the beginning looks drastically different. And does your insurance, has your insurance plan grown with the growth of your business? We mentioned on here investigating captive insurance. This is something that the IRS highly scrutinizes and would definitely need to be vetted with your CPA and truly is only probably a right fit for the right company, but it's a way to sort of self-insure um, your own company. Looking at the number of employees, you know, turnover is a big deal. It can actually really affect the business, the cash flow, how it all works. So making sure that you're thinking about that, it sounds crazy to think of it as a risk management, but just really ensuring that you have the right group of people to keep your business successfully moving forward. And ultimately, knowing what your risk is. So again, you're thinking about the business every day. You may not be thinking about your insurance plans and am I protected the right way. It just goes back to making sure that you have that right group of advisors in place to do that on you or your company's behalf. Business credit. So, you know, this is where CPAs year over year, you know, stay in business because every year there's something new coming out that affects businesses. Um, credits are a big deal, whether it's research and development credits, there's lots that are out there. So making sure that you're working with the right CPA who's well versed in the current tax environment and is making sure that you take advantage and save when those opportunities come up. And then always reviewing your employee benefits. So the bigger your company gets, the more group plans are gonna look more attractive. Um, and when do you transition to a PEO? You know, when do you join another group of businesses to maximize and offer maybe a wider breadth of employee benefits that you can't get as a you know, employer of five to 10 people? And we talked about the health insurance plan. So just making sure that you evaluate that since that is a big deal for people, especially as they look at their employers. You know, what are you offering? What are you covering? Do you allow for flexible saving accounts or health savings accounts as a way that I can help save for my own medical expenses? We talk about real estate. So being your own landlord, you know, looking at the real estate market, what it is right now, maybe it's a great time for sellers, not time for buyers. But when you think of the business and how it operates, does owning that warehouse or factory make sense? You know, could you be paying yourself to be your own landlord? Um, looking at cost segregation, again, when you think about your cash flow planning, having that team that's looking not only at this year, but the years beyond and thinking, does cost segregation make sense this year? Should I do a study? And then leveraging debt and interest rates appropriately. We're in an incredibly low interest rate environment. 
any financial advisor out there is going to tell you to leverage debt and invest in the market because of the interest rate arbitrage. So really making sure that you've structured your debt within the business as well as personally, because there are ways to do it so that there's either overlap or that you're structuring it so that it's optimal on both sides for you. And we'll talk about business succession. So business succession, you know, now you're at the point where you're debating on selling the business. You're thinking about your end game. I'm at the point where I want to retire. I need to start thinking about what this looks like. So first and foremost, do you have a formal plan? Have you thought about whether you would sell internally to employees or to a third party? Has anyone approached you? I think what we saw last year with the pandemic is it was a buying opportunity for some businesses. And people took it as a way to say, hey, you know, we would offer you X for your business. And people kind of thinking, I don't know, is that the right number for my business? I've never had it valued. So making sure that you have a formal valuation. You know, Therese talked about ways that business owners like to cut costs. When they see the sticker price for a business valuation, they're normally like, oh, I don't want to do it. It just seems like an unnecessary expense. But the more serious you are about passing on that business, that is truly where the business valuation is going to be really important. And then looking at your cash flow, does it look appealing to potential you know, buyers? If you're that person that's running everything you can through the business and really trying to get that net income to be as low as possible so you're not paying as much taxes, that's not going to look good if you're looking at it from an EBITDA standpoint, um, just p and balance sheets as they get those different documents. That's really where, again, you need to start looking at do I, in theory, need to start making those books look a little better so that I'm more attractive to a buyer? And then tying in risk management, is that buy-sell in place? Do you have it set up? And is it funded? So we find that a lot of business owners set up buy-sell agreements, but they don't fund it because they've maybe gotten hung up on the valuation, how they'd want it paid out. Um, they don't understand maybe their respective partner's personal situation. So as Therese talked about with the corporate structure where partners come into play, this is also where planning with your partner becomes pretty important because a buy-sell is a two, three, four-way potentially arrangement where you're thinking about other people's individual personal financial plans and how you would structure if, God forbid, the worst happened and maybe you passed away, would that significant other take over the business? Would you need to buy them out? Um, there's lots to think about. So again, making sure you have that conversation at the start of your business and then proactively as it grows. Because we've seen those situations where people do the buy-sell when the business has started and maybe they've put a $4 million valuation to it. And here we are 20 years later the worst has happened, and now the business is worth 50, but on paper, it's worth X. So now you're in a pickle because you're not really giving that potential spouse, you know, really what that business is worth. So you really need to make sure that's a document that you keep up to date and look at as your business grows. So to tie it all together, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, just our approach uh, with business owners. So we've talked a lot about the integration, which is why I like to refer to this as the Venn diagram, where your business and your personal planning really intersect. Because again, what you're doing on the business is going to affect personal, and what you do on your personal may affect your business. So really making sure that they're intertwined and they're looked at holistically, because that way you're going to ensure that you have the best plan in place for you both personally and for your corporation or LLC or whatever business structure you have. So really the steps that need to be taken when you're evaluating your business plan. First and foremost, goals. You can't plan unless you've identified what you're planning for. Is it to you know, retire at some point and step away from the business? Is it to pass that business on to family, to friends, to internal employees? What lifestyle are you looking to live and how can the business help you afford that lifestyle? Once you've prioritized and looked at those goals, then it's time to implement. 
So then it's time to look at what is everything we just talked about. How do you evaluate the corporate structure, the cash flow, the deductions, the succession plan? Tying that all in, putting that plan in place, and then monitoring it. So you've heard that common theme throughout the presentation, that you have to continually be proactive and evaluate everything that you're doing. So monitoring it is key. And then, you know, at that point, you're sort of at the place where hopefully it's you've got the right team around you to kind of help do all these things. And you can really, again, go back to focusing truthfully just on your business. So the process that we kind of walk through when we're dealing with a business owner is doing an analysis of the business, really trying to make sure that you understand what the business does, financial opportunities, what the forecast looks like, then getting into that corporate structure. Are you set up in the best way possible? Maybe you started as a Schedule C or a single, single member LLC, and now it's time to really think about you know, putting that corporate structure in place. Which one is best for you? Then taking a look at the cash flow. Is it optimal? Is there areas of improvement? Are there things that maybe you've run through the business that might not be great from an IRS standpoint or from a business succession standpoint? Looking at those tax deductions, again, being on top of the current tax environment, thinking about what your business is forecasted to do and making sure that any tax savings that you can take advantage of are being reviewed. And then implementing all those solutions. So again, having that right team around you, whether it's your financial advisor, your CPA, an attorney, um, I think a good CFO or just a, that bookkeeper that's where he's talked about, all the right people that are going to put those mechanics in place to help make sure that you're protected and that your business is a well-oiled machine. And then monitoring everything that is happening and then designing the exit strategy. So when you see the life of a business owner, I think it's cool to see when you watched a business owner start their business, have seen it grown, and then now it's at the point where they're you know, looking to sell. And I think that's hard for a lot of business owners to think about because it's really been everything that has occupied your thoughts for 30, 40 plus years. And some people think, I never really want to step away. I just want to cut back my hours or not work as hard. So that's really where not only is the valuation important, but also looking at the people that are around you. Do you have the right successors? Um, are family members interested in possibly taking over the business? And are they trained and able to do so? So all conversations that are good for maybe a third party to have with you so that you, don't, you can have sort of objective opinions as you think about exiting something that you just spent a huge portion of your life growing and building. So with that, we want to, you know, that kind of concludes everything we wanted to discuss today. So we will leave the remaining portion um, over to the questions. Thank you, Aaron. That was fantastic. Um, it was a great presentation. There's a lot of valuable information in there. Um, one of the questions we have um, is, is uh, very pertinent. Um, you know, that can be overwhelming when you think about all of these uh, different steps and items that you need to check off in the box. And I'm sure in your practice, as it is in ours, it can take a long time to help a business owner get through that process. So I think the question is around what, what are kind of the first couple of steps you would recommend someone take to start that process, the baby steps to get walking. Absolutely. I think first and foremost, it's building your team. So, you know, you're not going to be able to walk those steps alone. I think if you try, you're ultimately going to affect the business probably negatively because you're going to try to wear hats that you probably shouldn't wear as a business owner. So first and foremost, find that good CPA, find the right financial advisor, find the right attorney, you get the people in place that you think are going to be helpful. And then, like you said, take the baby steps. That's why if like, you think about the process, really look at each chunk as one thing. Okay, what are my goals? Get those flushed out and then move on from there. You don't need to do everything at once. You don't need to rush out and retirement plan, insurance, corporate structure. Really think about what's important and prioritize and then work with that team and go you know, down the list until you're at a point where you've kind of covered everything. 
Okay, that's a really good point. And I think it's a good segue into uh, kind of the next question. Um, you know, business owners are always trying to balance um, their cash flow, which you talked a lot about. And there was uh, some discussion about, you know, the good team having a good bookkeeper and the importance of that. You know, at what point do you find with your clients that it makes sense to have external people filling those roles as opposed to hiring those as internal people to your business? Uh, Therese, if you want to jump in on the bookkeeper part, since I know you mentioned a good example there. Sure. Bookkeeper, generally, I, I do think, uh, well, first of all, you can find a lot of bookkeepers out there. Um, so it, you could look at your cost, your budget, what are your goals? Um, you know, internally, you it is easier to work with a bookkeeper you have in-house because you can have them run other reports or analysis that, you know, someone just doing data entry may not provide you. And the analysis of what your business needs, I, I believe that if, especially if you're trying to grow, that's what you need to get to the next level. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think all of us as business owners are, are coming off this pandemic with a, a new realization of the need to be prepared for the unknown, what we can't see coming. Um, and I think it really woke us up to that new reality for us. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you help businesses prepare for a, a, an emergency, something that they may not see coming? I think a big part of that is, you know, like we talked about, is just having the right cash on hand and then looking at if you don't have the cash, maybe it's tied up, maybe your receivables are structured in a way, is then looking at your debt. You know, do you have a line of credit or something that is available to you, you know, just like we would say personally in case of an emergency um, and thinking about how this flows to your personal side, you know, are you protected on the personal side? Have you invested and saved to where if your business took a dive for a year that you could float your lifestyle, you know, for a certain period of time? Thinking again, how those sort of overlap. And I think last year, I mean, you saw that happen, whether it was, whether you're a business owner or not, you know, savings actually across the U.S. were at an all-time high uh, because people really, one, couldn't spend maybe on some things they normally could, but they also went into sort of hibernation fear mode of how long is this going to last? You know, when people lost their jobs, business owners lost contracts. I mean, I always think of our poor restaurants that just try to thrive on, you know, takeout or DoorDash and Postmates. Um, you know, they really had to reevaluate business models and staffing and menus and things like that. So I think there's the best thing you can do is save, build that emergency fund and have the right credit in place. Do you, should you need to tap it? Excellent. Um, you know, once you establish your team, this question is related to um, how often you should really check in. So I, I think about, you know, your financial advisor or your uh, CPA, for example. Um, do you have a recommendation on kind of how often they should be checking in with you, checking in with their CPA uh, and their other professionals to make sure they're on track? Therese, maybe from your perspective, as you know, with your background working in the CPA space, maybe talk about how often you met with, you know, business owners, and I'm happy to jump in from the wealth management side. Sure. I mean, it, it depends, right? You, if you don't have a lot going on with your business, if it's pretty consistent every year in and year out, I would say at least once or twice a year. Um, you know, especially towards the end of the year, just to check in if there's anything you could do uh, before the end of the year um, to help you from a tax position, right? Just because it, you, any action you take after year end kind of limits what you're able to do. And so being able to talk to your CPA before the end of the year is very helpful. And then of course, um, you know, come tax time. So I would say two times minimum, and then you also have business owners who have a lot going on. They're growing their business. Um, and sometimes it makes sense to have quarterly meetings, right? You can check in with how their financials look or, you know, what they're doing for their business. If they want to buy equipment now versus later, again, leveraging interest rates, does it make sense now versus later, depreciation, that type of stuff, just helping tie everything in together. Um, is helpful, as well as, again, um, you know, whatever happens to your business, 
um, flows through to you personally, which means if you have a profitable business, you could have a hefty tax bill. And so you'll have to be mindful of quarterly estimated tax payments just to make sure that you have no interest or penalties um, on your tax return. So, um, you know, just to summarize, it really depends. It depends on you and your business and what you have going on. But definitely, um, you know, talk to your CPA at least twice a year. And I would say, too, that a lot of times with financial advisors, you kind of piggyback on those CPA conversations, whether you're doing it together or, you know, like you mentioned, hey, these are gonna be your estimates. Okay, now I gotta go talk to my financial advisor to figure out how I'm gonna pay for those. You know, do I need to sell assets and what assets am I selling and when um, to be able to make those payments? So I think that's really where the, you know, from a team perspective, it's good to have all those people in place because we are gonna work together, you know, from a financial advisor perspective, they're not going to do anything without consulting with the CPA. And a lot of what the CPA is going to do is going to come back to the financial advisor. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I would think, um, you know, the advice may be that the money you would pay to maybe meet with your CPA more often or your attorney more often uh, pales in comparison to what you would save in the long run, wouldn't you think? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, more of a technical question here um, and and maybe not so easy to ask, uh, I mean, to answer really quickly, but determining the structure of your business, you know, a sole proprietor to an LLC all the way up to a C Corp. Um, do, you, do you have kind of a framework by which you help people make that decision? Um, and, and how do you determine uh, which one is best? I think for that, a lot of it goes into, you know, the goals and the, the structure of who's making up that business. So if there's one person and it's a small business that's growing, you can start small. And maybe that's where the Schedule C, the single member LLC uh, works. If it's where you're now gonna start to think about bringing on partners or it's a group of people, um, you know, that's where corporations or LLCs may make more sense. Um, the, how big it's gonna grow, you know, certain numbers like Therese mentioned, S-Corps can have 100 shareholders. So if there's going to be more, then C-Corps are kind of a no-brainer. Are there deductions you want to take um, you know, through a C-Corp that maybe you can't through others? So it's just an evaluation process. It's a lot of Q&A with the respective business owner to understand what is going to be best for them, given the makeup of their business, both from what they do and also you know, the size of it. Interesting. So it's very much tailored to the individual. Um, and that's a large part of that uh, process, it sounds like. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's definitely not a one size fits all. I think it's something that is really customized based on the, the type of business and the owner themselves and what their goals are. And that's really great. Um, so, um, you know, you talked a little bit about keeping pace with changes in, in, in business and personal lives and things of that nature. And so this question is um, wondering if, if you can speak to any trends you're seeing lately, uh, especially considering the year we've come up, uh, uh, out of with your clients. Um, big trends that we are seeing are definitely the reevaluation of retirement plans. Um, a lot of people who had cash balance plans in place last year who saw their business take a hit, you know, those have minimum contribution requirements. And so having that, if they didn't have the cash flow or the assets to pay for them, I think you saw a lot of people looking to restructure or freeze or terminate those plans. So that's been a big one. Um, with debt, you know, we talked about the low interest rate environment, a lot of restructuring of debt, both personally and on the business side. Um, and then I think becoming a landlord looked a little more attractive to people or not being a landlord, you know, capitalizing on that real estate market that we're in and looking at, you know, hey, does it make sense at this point just to sell this warehouse, this whatever the, you know, whatever the asset is, because um, I'm going to make more right now than maybe I will in the future. Uh, I think those have been some common ones. And I think it's also just with all the tax changes. I think you've seen people really rely on the team around them more than ever. Um, you know, PPP loans, I mean, God bless CPAs and everything that they had to deal with last year with all the changes and um, last minute changes and new forms and calculations. I think that was a really big thing we got asked a lot of questions about was just how does this work? Do I need it? Who should I work with? And 
we really, again, had to partner up with that CPA. But those were, I would say, kind of the common trends. Thank you very much for that. Um, this next question, I think, you know, we're talking a lot about cash flow and, and it deals with seasonal businesses. How do you help counsel your clients that have uh, a real cyclical nature to their cash flow and need to plan a little more carefully? I think uh, that's probably where, like Teresa, how often you meet. Those are the people you're going to meet with, I think, more proactively because you're going to want to make sure that you're looking at what do those receivables look like? You know, what are you receiving in certain parts of the year? I can think of a business owner I work with right now uh, where in the type of business they're in, it's super lumpy. I mean, they might have a good first quarter, nothing second quarter, nothing third quarter, and then a great fourth quarter. So it's really making sure, especially as we talk about like how do you pay yourself, that you're paying yourself in a way that leaves the right amount of bit, uh, money in the business to help bridge those couple months, but also pay you enough to meet your you know, personal lifestyle. So I think those are the, the clients that you just have to kind of meet with more proactively and look at those cash flow projections and financial statements a little more closely to make sure that you're just building up the savings that's needed to help float it, or that you're building up the credit that's needed to help maintain the business and the sort of those famine months if you have a feast or famine type business. Excellent. It's been an excellent session and I've really been appreciative of your time. I have one more question and this is from, from me personally um, for uh, Ms. Tippy. I was wondering, uh, when you take K-1 distributions from your business, um, does this reduce the basis in your business so that if you sell it at one point in time, you may realize more capital gains? Is there kind of a negative offset to that distribution? Oh, I believe um, Therese may have had some issues and she dropped off the call. Aaron. Oh, she fell off. Well, maybe Aaron knows the answer to the question or do we need the CPA? I was definitely going to say I would default to a CPA there because there's a lot of mechanics that go in place. Um, but generally, I mean, from a cash flow perspective, I don't think, I know she's coming back on here, um, that's not going to affect basis too much. Um, but I would definitely default that to Therese. Okay, fair enough. We're going to go ahead and uh, let Therese connect really quickly. Hi, Therese. Uh, if you can ask that question again, Eric, and then Therese can weigh in. Um, sure, Therese, I had asked a question uh, regarding the K-1 distributions from a business as opposed to the W-2. Uh, when you take the K-1 distributions from a business, does that reduce uh, your basis in the business or your capital account, uh, thereby creating more of a capital gain later when you sell the business, potential and negative offset for, for taking too much K-1 income? And I think you're on mute, Therese, so you're going to have to unmute yourself. There we go. Yes, it does, Eric. So um, any distribution you take from your company reduces your basis in the entity. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that is all the time we have for questions. Uh, it's been an excellent session. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Marche to wrap us up. Well, I wanna thank everyone um, who's been here today, our, our panelists, and thank you so much for the expertise and for the great information. Uh, thank you so much for our attendees for attending. Look for an email soon with a link to the replay of this event. And you're welcome to share that replay with your friends and family. Here at Advice Chaser, we're all about helping you find a financial advisor who's a great fit for your life and your financial questions. Our matching service is free to you and every one of our advisor partners has committed to offer a free consultation to anyone we introduce them to. Find out more by going to advicechaser.com and clicking on the link to find an advisor. Once again, from Advice Chaser, thank you so much for coming and we'll see you at another webinar soon. Bye everyone.